Hello lovely people, how you doing? And in this video, on one of the best history channels on YouTube, we're going to use the history of mythology to understand, to really start to understand what the Sphinx is all about. Because we need to look at mythology or we're never going to crack what this mythological animal is. This, I am positing in this video, was two different animals. Firstly a dog, secondly a manticore, which is a man lion. And some people will say, Charles, it was a lion, Charles, it was a dog, Charles, it was a sheep, Charles, it was a goat. Let's look at, but, but the dog and the lion are, are two very popular theories adopted by historians and archaeologists. So let's examine them. Um, and you don't have to agree. It's purely optional, but I've been researching this for a long time and I'm going to put forward what I found. And I hope you find it very interesting because we're going to explain what's on the Nama tablet, what that is. Now, we've talked about this in a previous video as being a, a kind of Naga, um, because in the Indian tradition, this would be Vishnu, this would be Garuda, killing the Naga by stepping on his tail and then making him vomit the stones so he can chop his head off and lift him up into the sky and carry him away. And that makes sense looking at the tablet. But there's more to it than that, because a manticore, which is that, is also said to have a tail described as something like that. And we were going we're to get to that as well. And there is a relation between that and that and the Sphinx. There is flexibility in ancient times because we only have a fraction of the legends that survive from the ancient world. So the Sphinx. And we're going to see what Sphinx actually means in this video. And this is so interesting. So let's just first read this and then I'll tell you what it means in English. We're going to translate what Sphinx means. It's a very easy word. And uh, in fact, that is almost an English word. Try and guess what it is. And then I'm going to tell you what it is in about a minute. So let's read. In Greek tradition, the Sphinx has the head of a woman, the haunches of a lion and the wings of a bird. She is mythicized as treacherous and merciless, who will kill and eat those who cannot answer her riddle. This deadly version of the Sphinx appears in the, in the myth and drama of Oedipus. Unlike the Greek Sphinx, which was a woman, the Egyptian Sphinx is typically, typically shown as a man. In addition, the Egyptian Sphinx was viewed as, a benevolent, as benevolent, but having a ferocious strength similar to the malevolent Greek version. Both were thought to, uh, of as guardians and often flank the entrances to temples. So what's going on here? And why would you have a sphinx guarding temples? Well, let me try and clarify that. Sphinx in Greek means strangle, choke. It, it is an English word as well. What do you think? It, what's the English version? Pinch. Herodotus actually is the first to use the word sphinx, but he omits the S, he calls it a pinx. Which is most interesting indeed. So this is something that pinches you. It kills you by pinching, by choking, by strangling. Okay, that's a clue. And when we look at the sphinxes uh, in the early tradition, um, in the gallery, uh, we see that the, the archaeologists are showing lots of different types of mythological creatures as sphinxes, which is a bit of a problem. We see them using uh, different animals. We see, um, we see, firstly, there are two types of things going on, which is a problem. We see the sphinx without the wings, and we see the sphinx with, with the wings. And this is a massive problem because it looks to me like they're describing two different mythological animals as part of the same tradition. And of course, in Egypt, we also see them with different heads, heads of different animals as well. So what really is a sphinx? And this article is not very satisfying in telling us what a sphinx is. And if you look at similar hybrid creatures with the feline features, because um, some say it is a lion, there are two creatures which stand out in mythology. Just two. Only two. Um, one is a, one of them that isn't that is a, is a, is a Persian uh, gopat, so-called, similar to a sphinx. A winged bull or lion with a human face. Look, it's different. This one, the Egyptian sphinx does not have wings. 
And then this one here, uh, an archaeological object, that's inadmissible because we're looking at mythology. So a manticore. Um, what does a manticore mean? In, to translate, you can actually translate that directly into English. Uh, it means, um, it's from a contraction of man-tiger and it's had the word core attached, which means eater or gore in English. So it's a man-eater, a man-gora. And so this is why a manticore would protect the temple. It would literally threaten to eat the man if he ventured too far. And I am, I am positing in this video, first the Sphinx was a dog, then Khufu arrived, then by the New Kingdom, it had become a manticore. And we're going to prove that. That explains why the Sphinx was red, as you shall see, because manticores were red. It was painted red in the New Kingdom. The other thing it could be, Narashima, Narasimha. The problem, it's a man-lion, but the problem with this is, it's not that, because this is a human body and a lion's head. Um, a human body and a lion's head. So it's the opposite of what we see in Egypt. So it's not this, not this god slash creature. The Sphinx is also similar to a Pichu, which is like Pinch or Pinks. And this is a lion with wings. So the Sphinxes seem to be of two from two creatures. One of them is the Pichu. One of them, which is, is something with wings, a dragon. It's basically a lion dragon with wings. One of them is a Manticore, which is basically a human face attached to a lion's body. And that is mainly what the Sphinx turned into after first being something else. And you're going to say, okay, well, what was it then? Tell me what it was. And I am going to tell you right now exactly what the Sphinx was. The Sphinx, you see, ladies and gents, before being a manticore, was a dog. And it must have been a dog. There's, there's no way around this. It must have been a dog. It has a dog's body. And the way Giza is laid out, I have shown in another video, and I won't get too far into this, is that this is laid out according to Germanic mythology. Nine pyramids, nine worlds. This is the Shambhala legend in stone. If you're familiar with the Shambhala legend, it says a sacred white mountain surrounded by other mountains somewhere in the north, and this is the center of the world. And it seems every country wanted to make their own Shambhala, and this is what Giza is. Every country where the Aryans possibly ventured, because this seems to be an Aryan legend. You see this in all the countries dominated by the Aryans, and the Aryans are the only tribe I know who seem to have gone to America, who seem to have gone all across Europe and Asia. And they're the ones who ran the entire pyramid tradition, pyramid religion, in my opinion. And the reason you need to have a giant dog is so that you will generate an afterlife afterwards, at the end of it all. Because in the, in the, in the Germanic tradition, the giant dog at the end of the world will swallow the sun and the world will end. He will leap up and swallow the sun. Meanwhile, the giant serpent, um, Jormungandr, will let go of his tail uh, after fighting with Thor and he will die. Thor will die. According to this, the legend of Gamer about the giant dog, Gammerer, um, or Gamerer, he will fight Tyr. Tyr is the sun god, and he will fight against Tyr. This is a, a Germanic Jesus, one of the Germanic Jesuses, or Mars. And he will fight against Tyr, and they will slay each other. In another version, uh, in which he is just called Fenrir, he will leap up, he will leap up and swallow the sun. And by representing this at Giza, you assure, you assure people, you assure the gods that everything is going according to plan, and that they, and then should the world end, and it is the case that this whole complex was generated due to fears of the end of the world, according to Arab legend, fears of the flood, fears of the end of Egypt, that should the world end, there will be a rebirth. And that is what the mythology promises. So that's why this could be a giant dog. So then people like Khufu arrived 
And he certainly wasn't the first one at the Giza complex. There was stuff there before. I believe there's some First Dynasty stuff there as well, some Second Dynasty stuff on the plateau. But he transformed Giza and he changed it into something else. And he did the bulk of the work on the Great Pyramid. But I'm sure it was a pyramid there before, even before his time. And because he did so much work there, it seems that he or whoever did so much, put so much, would put so much effort into them is a likely culprit for whoever recarved the Sphinx, recarved the Sphinx's face. And I've posited before that, you know, this, it could be his daughter because he had a very infamous daughter. Um, she was accused of uh, sacred prostitution by later, by later um, generations who didn't, who weren't aware of what sacred prostitution was. Um, it was something to venerate the gods. And they said, oh, she was just a prostitute and she was, uh, according to Herodotus, the Egyptians told him that he need, uh, she, need, uh, she needed some more money to buy some stones for the, her pyramid. Uh, so she engaged in this practice. But even Herodotus should have known uh, that it was similar to the stories he had heard about Babylon. So who is the Sphinx? And I, I will admit, it doesn't quite look like her face. It looks actually a little bit different, but the ear, the eye is very similar from a certain angle, a certain perspective. But the face, I will admit, is a little bit different. Some people say it's Thutmosis IV. Others have other ideas. I don't know who it is, but I know that they changed it from a dog into a manticore because a manticore is the only creature that fits the Sphinx in its later form and also fits what's on the Nama tablet, as we shall see. Something that has been compared to the Sphinx. And are there creatures with man's faces, like a manticore does, a lion with a man's face? Yes, from Asia. Yes, there's a, there's a monkey with a human face. There's the, uh, the proboscis monkey. It's got a kind of a human face, sort of. It seems there are creatures in Asia with human faces. But we're not debating whether or not they existed. But the Romans said the manticore was from Asia. And now we're going to read about the manticore and we're going to find out about this very interesting creature. So let's read. And after we read, we'll be able to compare it directly to the Nama tablet and show that the manticore legend is very flexible and is being applied to both this and to that. And I believe ancient architects compared that to the Sphinx. He's onto something interesting in that regard as well. And we're going to see why. So basically, let's read something from a Roman historian who I wasn't aware of called Elian in his work, The Characteristics of Animals. And let's read this through completely because we want to know exactly what's going on. So we can compare it to the Sphinx and to compare it to what's happening on the Nama tablet. So. It says here, there is in India a wild beast, powerful, daring, as big as the largest, largest lion of a red color like cinnabar. Now, the thing is, the Sphinx was painted red in the New Kingdom and no one knows why. This is why. That is why. And, and I believe Robert Temple in his Sphinx mystery said it was, it was in frightful bad taste. But this is the reason why. They thought, oh, here's a red manticore. They, it must have been already carved before the New Kingdom. And they encountered it and they said, well, hang on a sec. Uh, let's make a man. Well, well, let's make a manticore or let's color it in red since it is a manticore. Shaggy like a dog. And in the language of India, it is called Martichorus. Its face, however, is not that of a wild beast, but of a man. And it has three rows of upper teeth set in its upper jaw and three in the lower. These are exceedingly sharp and larger than the fangs of a hound. Its ears also resemble a man's except that they are larger and shaggy. Its eyes are blue-gray, and they too are like a man's. But its feet and claws, you must know, are those of a lion. To the end of its tail is attached a sting of a scorpion, and this might be over a cubit in length. And the tail has stings at intervals on either side, but the tip of the tail gives a fatal sting to anyone who encounters it, and death is immediate. If one pursues the beast, it lets fly its stings like arrows sideways, and it can shoot a great distance. And when it discharges its stings straight ahead, it bends its tail back. However, it shoots in a back if, however, it shoots in a backward direction, as the sakai do, um, then it stretches its tail to its full extent. 
Any creature that the missile hits, it kills. The elephant alone, it does not kill. These things which it shoots are a foot long and the thickness of a bulrush. Now let's look at a bulrush quickly. Well, there's a bulrush. And now we can start to understand what is being depicted on the Nama tablet, you see, because on the Nama tablet, we have just such a, just such a, just such a thing happening. We have this um, bulrush-like tail that Garuda is standing upon. He's sort of stepping on the tail in order to prevent, I suppose, the stings of this mythological creature from being discharged and wounding Garuda. And here we have the stings look, looking like arrows described in a way which we have just seen described in the Asian legend, which is just fascinating. So um, these I've compared to a pixiu, um, and this um, it could be compared to a manticore, and if so, it could be compared to the sphinx, which is quite interesting. So let's continue. Now, Kestius asserts, and he says that, that Indians confirm his words, that in the places where those things have been let fly, others spring up. So this evil produces a crop. And according to the same writer, the manticore for choice devours human beings. Indeed, it will slaughter a great number. And it lies in wait, not for a single man, but who would set upon, but, uh, but would set upon two or th even three men, and alone overcomes even that number. All other animals it defeats. The lion alone it can never bring down. This creature takes special delight in gorging human flesh as its very name testifies. For in the Greek language it means man-eater and its name is derived from its activities. Like the stag, it is extremely swift. Now the Indians hunt the young of these animals while they are still without stings in their tails, which they then crush with a stone to prevent them from growing stings. The sound of the voice is as near as possible that of a trumpet. Ctesias describes that he has, not, he has actually seen this animal in Persia. It was brought from India as a present to the Ind Persian king. If Cestius is to be regarded as a sufficient authority on such matters, at any rate, after hearing of the peculiarities of the animal, one must pay heed to the historian Knidos. Knidos. You know, it sounds like it was almost a real creature, doesn't it? Which is really interesting. And just a bit more about from um, uh, uh, Posanius. The Greece described the, the, the beast described by Ctesias in his Indian history, which he says is called a Manticoros by the Indians and Maneater by the Greeks. I am inclined to think is a tiger, but that it has three rows of teeth along each jaw and spikes at the tip of its tail, with which it defends itself as close quarters, while it hurls them like an archer's arrows at more distant enemies. This is, I think, a false story that the Indians pass on from one to another, according to their excessive owing to their excessive dread of the beast. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And Pliny the Elder did not agree with Pausanias, and he um, followed Aristotle in calling it a real creature. Look, honestly, I think it sounds like a real creature from the from the detail we've seen here, which is quite interesting. Um, who knows? Who knows? So this can explain um, the arrow-like tail on this creature here. It's got a bit of, even though it's an it's it's technically a naga if we're following the Indian tradition, it's also being depicted as a kind of scorpion-like manticore as well. And um, is that what is being de depicted on the Sphinx? Does the Sphinx have hollows on its tail where once were carved uh, arrows? I guess someone will have to have a look. So that explains the Sphinx, the name of the Sphinx. Um, as a pinch, it's a pinch, that's what, that's what it means. Uh, that explains why it was red, because the manticore was red. The people arriving into Egypt, the New Kingdom people, um, who might have been Aryans, said, oh, it looks like a manticore, let's paint it red. Um, so what do you think of this theory? I think we're, we're starting to cover the history of the Sphinx, but we have to look at mythology in order to do so. And this is sadly lacking in archaeology. So I hope you have um, enjoyed. Okay.